Now let's switch to David Hume. He wrote uh, The Treatise of Human Nature, and he wrote An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Both of those, uh, there are excerpts in your textbook from both of those. David Hume, um, he basically takes Locke a little step further. Um, and he, he's known, he, he, takes, he takes empiricism so far, it ends up in trouble. Um, and then we'll end Unit 2 by looking at Kant, who's got to kind of rescue empiricism, because otherwise, uh, as you'll see, Locke goes so far that he says, well, we don't know anything at all. We can't know anything at all, except something that's already happened, but we can't predict anything. And Kant, Kant's got to say, well, wait a minute here. Um, that's not quite true. But for, so let's look at uh, Hume a little bit more. And so he says that every belief has to, is a, of two kinds. It's either a relation of ideas or a matter of fact. Um, and relation ideas refers to stuff like uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, or sort of the way that logic works. Now matters of facts are things that um, we know or we can confirm because of experience. Now, he says everything in your mind is a perception. And he divides perceptions into two parts, impressions and ideas. And this kind of relates to Locke's idea of simple and complex ideas. Impressions consist of the direct ex sense experience of things, right, a sensation, or of a reflection about your passions and your emotions. So keep in mind, um, in your mind, you'll have perceptions. Under that, you've got impressions. And then you've got ideas or maybe we should start at the bottom, ideas are copies of impressions. Ideas belong to the intellect. Um, so again, ideas are kind of effects created in the mind because of the impressions from outside the mind, and they're less vivid versions of it, basically. Right? So if I hear a loom, the sound of the loom would be the impression, but then now I think about it, you know, oh, that was really neat. Last summer I heard a loon. Now I'm on the realm of uh, on the realm of the idea. Like there was there was I, I can think about it. I can recall it. I can kind of remember vaguely how it sounds like. I probably couldn't copy it, um, but I I do know I heard about it and I can recall the idea of it. So keep in mind then your brain is filled with sort of those immediate impressions, and then the ideas would be sort of copies of them. And he also talks about complex ideas, like the idea of a unicorn, or the idea of a gold mountain, those gold mountains one that he uses. Um, that can be broken down into simple ideas, like a unicorn would be a horse and a, and, a, and a horn, and you stick them together and you get a horse. A gold mountain would be the concept of gold and mountain, or impression of gold, impression of mountain, and you stick them, actually it would probably be an idea of gold, but you could have an impression of a mountain, and you stick those together. Um, and so you can, you can break those simple ideas down, and then once you break those ideas down, you can go back to the impression that those ideas are based on. Right? So the impression is like genesis, and then you just sort of build up. And this is very opposite Plato. Right? He thinks that there's an idea at the top that's the most important thing, and, and things that you see and touch are sort of shallow impressions. This is like a complete reversal, that the, the things that you see and touch give rise to an impression, which gives rise to an idea, and that's less and less vivid, less and less real than the impression itself. I gave you this funny little con um, cartoon, which kind of keep in mind. I don't know if you can read it. It might be small, but it says empirical knowledge insufficient. A big pun on the fish, right? Um, so this guy is fishing, and he says, "Ooh, I've got dinner," and he doesn't realize he's about to be dinner. So the joke will make sense by the time we we finish this, hopefully. So there's something um, in Hume. It's called the problem in induction. So I'm going to try to explain what, why that's a, a key to phrase. So ba Hume basically argues, as I said, that all knowledge begins with these basic units of sensory experience, right, impressions. Um, but he also argues that all knowledge that you can be absolutely certain is true, because those matters of fact, is limited to sense experience. Now, here's where Hume and Locke differ a little bit. Remember, he said. Locke thought that human knowledge can kind of go beyond it. Hume basically says, no, it can't. Now, for Hume, the idea of causation is really, really key. Because he claims that causation, the concept of causation, that's what allows us to go beyond what's immediately present to the senses. Sen senses. 
So you need perception, right? which again we had ideas and impressions belong to perception, and you need memory. Um, so these three things, causation, perception, and memory, are responsible for all our knowledge about the world. That kind of makes, makes sense, right? If I know that if I hold this pen in the air and I let go, it's going to fall, right? And so I do it three times, I can predict that if I did it a fourth time, it's going to happen. I can make an assumption that it's going to do that every single time I open my fingers, the pen will fall. But Hume actually says, no, you can't be sure. So Hume takes the idea of causation um, and challenges it. And he says, what is it? in our experience, allows you to know about cause and effect. Um, why is it that you think that this will happen? And so he uses the example, not of pencils, but of billiard balls. Um, and he says, you just think that because you hit that billiard ball, ball multiple times um, in the past, and when you hit it, it rolled, or when I open my hand fingers, it drops. Um, so I just predict that it's going to say, it will, it will do the same in the future. So we're relying on the kind of reasoning that's called induction, right? So our, our knowledge about cause and effect is arrived at because we induct from past experience. So he's saying we don't actually know about cause and effect through reason, but only through experience, right? There isn't some sort of light bulb reasoning thing. It's not that I just automatically know this pen will drop, it's because I've done it so many times and it dropped that I then can predict that every single time I do it, it will fall down. So he says it's not through reason, it's through experience. However, he says there is no knowledge about the future there, and there is no reasoning that can justify your prediction about the future. Right? So he ends up saying we are not reasonably justified in making any inductive inference about the world. And here's where we get to, to Hume's radical skepticism, the fact that it, empiricism nearly fails as a, as a science or as a philosophy, and it's called Hume's fork. And we're not talking about a fork that you eat supper with, we're talking more like a tuning fork, or like a fork in the road. So remember I said there was two kinds of knowledge. There was that relation of ideas and matters of fact. Now you can stick a few terms next to it. You also have, next to relation ideas, you have a prior thinking, right? It's not a matter of experience, it's just using logic. And he puts geometry, arithmetic, logic, algebra, all of that is these relation of ideas. And he also puts something called an analytic statement. And those were those statements like, all sisters are female, or all bachelors are unmarried, right? We just know the definition of bachelor, so we don't need to go asking, you know, are you married, are you married? Um, we know the definition of sister is that they're female, uh, so therefore, all sisters have got to be female. We could say all brothers are male, right? We just know the definition of brother is that it's a male relative. Um, same with uncles or aunts, we can put the same thing in there. So that, that is what's called an analytic statement, um, a priori thinking, this relation of ideas. Remember, we, he splits knowledge into those two, that's one fork, you can see my picture here. The other, the other side of the fork is the matters of fact, and that's all a, a posteriori. That's all got to do with ideas that relate to the world that you know through experience, right? The sun will rise every day, I'm not counting foggy days or rainy days. Um, the ball will roll um, every time, the pen will drop every time. And what he says is that um, matters of fact can teach you new things about the world, but they can never be certain. Right? So. Logic, the analytic statements, you have to, you don't move forward any further, but matters of fact, you could, you could produce new knowledge, but you won't ever be certain about it. And this is this radical skepticism. He says if all knowledge comes from perceptive, then either your ideas are very certain, i.e. it's a relation of, of ideas, but it's not very informative because it doesn't produce anything new. It's, it's stuff we kind of already know. Or, our ideas might be informative, right? it might be something new knowledge we produce, but it's not going to be certain because of that problem of induction that we looked at in the last slide. So we don't know the sun will rise tomorrow just because it ro 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 rose in the past. We don't know the ball will roll just because the ro ball rolled in the past. Right? No appeal to experience can justify predictions about the future because that would be this funny sort of logic where you, what you basically are saying is that the future will be like the past because in the past the future has always been like the past. Like that's the kind of logic that you need to make a prediction about the future. And Hume's like, nah, that just doesn't work. Um, 
you can't make a prediction about the future based on the past because that's assuming that the past will be like the future and the future was like the past and that's just a circular kind of logic. So that's why he ends up claiming that anything that you can be absolutely sure about um, you know in a sense has already happened but you can't be sure about things that will happen sort of in the future. Or they'll teach us new things about the world but you can't quite be certain that it's absolutely true and that it absolutely will happen in the future. So this basically undermines, as you can imagine, um, empiricism as a uh, verifiable source of knowledge that you can be absolutely sure about. Um, and this is why we will need Kant to come in, which we'll look at in our next unit.